All right, so what I'm thinking here is we're taking a look at our journal. I mean, as we've said previously, the list of stuff we have remaining is dwindling quite rapidly at that. So for that reason, we may... We... Hmm... Hmm. I feel like we have this and we've not yet turned it in. Did we get this? from one of our most recent missions against Cerberus. I feel like we did. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I mean, in that case, it'd be kind of nice to turn it in. However, I was thinking, I mean, we can basically, we can practically count on one hand the number of missions that we have left. Citadel Shore Leave is the Citadel DLC, which is something that we said previously. We're going to wait for that quite a bit. Priority Horizon is the main quest mission we have coming up next. We have... Citadel Arya Talok is the Citadel, or rather, uh, not the Citadel DLC, that, that's that one. This is the Omega DLC, and although these technically aren't tied to the Omega DLC, there's certainly some overlaps, as they are, of course, all affiliated with Arya, so we're deliberately saving these to go along with the uh, Omega DLC to pair together with those. That leaves us with Leviathan, which, of course, we did start previously, we did just the very beginning in which, well, we went to Dr. Bryson's lab and just in time to witness him getting murdered and I gathered a little bit of information from his lab and now we're basically looking to find the next person who's doing research on this mysterious Leviathan and apparently that's Garneau. We filtered out some potential locations and got a precise enough search that we know exactly where we're expecting to find this individual. But maybe it is worth a, a quick stop at the Citadel, because I'm pretty sure that we did this. And I feel like if we don't do it right now, I am probably going to forget, because apparently we already did forget about this. So, or maybe it's that we, did we just get it on Ontarum? Maybe that's it. We just picked that up. So maybe we haven't really forgotten it, per se, as much as we just haven't yet had the chance to turn it in. So let's do that real quick. Okay, so we know, at least in theory, where this individual is located, the one that we're trying to turn in the quest to, so hopefully it's just a quick stop at the Here embassies. Dock, Normandy. Do you need ground transport? I need to get to the embassies. Because that's yes, where Commander. the quest, at least, told us this person was. Okay. More specifically, where within the embassies, perhaps a different question is it you? No? I don't remember we spoke to you at one point in time. My guess is they're beyond the Spectre office. This was the Elcor, this was the Asari, both of whom we had quests for previously. This, I thought it said it was a human. Okay. Let's see, so I think this person's up here somewhere. I think maybe even in this back corner. Heard the sound effect. Oh, it's a it's a Turian? I thought it said human previously, but no, apparently not. You're Intel, right? I found these encryption codes on a Cerberus engineer. I thought they might be helpful. Cerberus ciphers. That's exactly what we've been looking for. Thank you, Commander. There you go. Does seem as though it was just a quick matter of getting a little bit more reputation and some more assets. Can't tell at this stage exactly how many that was worth. But how much money is to wait? We actually have a decent amount of money right now. Not quite enough to get the most expensive of things. But we could get a Black Widow. Once upon a time, we were saying how this would have been perhaps the best sniper rifle option for us. There are, by some metrics, it is the best sniper rifle in the game. Huge damage, some built in armor and cover penetration. It fires a few shots before you need to reload, which is convenient. I think it does hit a little bit harder than the Javelin, but the Javelin has some other quality of life functions where it gives you X-ray vision, whereas the Black Widow does not do that. So in that way, it is, to at least a certain extent, a matter of personal preference. The key difference is that if you're willing to wait until you do the Admiral Corps mission in which you get the Javelin, you get it for free, whereas Black Widow 
as we're seeing here, very much not free. Cerberus Harrier, really strong assault rifle, huge damage, huge damage per second, just that it has, oddly enough, the, the thing that, that makes it less effective is that it does not have much ammo capacity, so you blow through that pretty quickly. So, bring that again, we personally are not really using assault rifles, and we already have the Typhoon, the Typhoon is amazing, especially for our squad mates, so this is not really urgent for that reason. Piranha is a shotgun, and it is sort of a hybrid shotgun assault rifle. I think we've spoken about many of these weapons previously, because we've been, been here previously and theorized as to which weapons and when we might want to purchase them. But uh, this one, sort of a hybrid between assault rifle and a shotgun. Not good from an accuracy standpoint, but in terms of if you do get a, most of the pellets to hit, does give you a lot of damage. And... Although we have, what, the Crusader, and didn't we pick up another shotgun somewhat recently that we were also fairly big fans of? We have the Venom, and we've upgraded that. That's also very, very good, I think more so for Shepard than for squad mates, though. And again, this is probably another instance of whatever shotgun we get is more likely to be something that we put on squad mates than it is Shepard. Also, the Piranha, I think for what's worth, is on the light side, surprisingly light side for a shotgun. So if you are a power base build, you might be able to justify using it and still not have a, a ridiculously long cooldown time. Power magnifier apparently we missed on the SMG, which we might have been putting this on squad mates for those who can only wield pistols and SMGs, so I think it's 5% more than the subsequent upgrade, so I mean that's something. It's also relatively cheap. So, hmm. Also Eagle Solid. Don't really care about the Greaves. Hmm. Let's get the SMG power magnifier, because it's small, and that way, if we still want to, we, we can get the Harrier, we can get the Piranha. I don't think either one is urgent. Just trying to think of... Anticipating what our next mission is going to be, are we going to be using anyone who might opt to equip those weapons? I don't think so. So I think we can be patient if we'd like. Okay. We have a couple of things we can do here, it seems. So this might have been from overhearing some additional conversations. Civilian consultant authorization. An importer-exporter with past convictions for smuggling has offered to gather critical supplies for Alliance forces and civilian medical emergencies. CSEC believes the offer is in good faith and has refused to make an arrest, but is legally restricted from accepting her offer without Spectre authorization. Don't remember who this was. No, this must have been a conversation that we overheard, but I don't remember when or where. You can understand the risk of doing this if this person is is not being honest, and given their history of criminal activity, could mean that perhaps it's all an elaborate ruse, and so it could come back to bite us. However, if they are being honest, then it sounds like they could help the Alliance get some valuable... Uh, Materials, I suppose? Supplies of some variety? So, I don't remember how gaming was. I don't remember what exactly the result of this one is, but I'm going to take the risk on it. I think, I think I'm going to authorize it. Okay. Then we have the Asari Huntress Weapon Permit. This one I do remember. I do remember well. What's up, Arumi? How's it going? We're doing some Mass Effect 3 Legendary Edition. So, a Huntress Aeon Tagoni is a patient at Huerta Memorial Hospital. This is the Asari that we overheard the conversations of at the Huerta Memorial Hospital. If you remember, when you go in, it's off to the right, after, sort of behind the desk that's in the middle, and she's speaking to a therapist, and she's talking about a an experience that she had in which she was deployed on a colony, a human colony, I believe, Tip Tree, and the colony that she was supposed to protect got invaded by Reapers while she was there. She had to retreat, flee with one of the colonists, and when they returned to try to phone for help, found that the Reapers were still there, and that much of the colonists had either been killed or captured, and ultimately, the Reapers, namely a Banshee specifically, was starting to hunt the two of them down, the Asari and the colonists that had gone with her, they tried to hide, but the Banshee was closing in on them, and the other colonist was being kind of loud, and so 
she she realized that she had to kill this other colonist, otherwise they were going to get discovered, and that was haunting her. And so that's what she was speaking to the the doctor or the the psychiatrist at the hospital about. We overheard them or a series of numerous conversations that ultimately spanned the entire length of of that mission. The summary there, and we also subsequently learned that uh, that colonist in question was in fact Joker's sister. So. It hits home. It's a little more personal than it might have originally seemed. But what she wants is a weapon permit because her whole deal was that when she quickly left with that colonist to flee from the Reapers, she or she originally, when she was first alerted to the Reaper's presence, was in the shower or something like that and was not armed with any of her weapons. And so she had said, if I only had my weapon on me, I could have dealt with the Reapers and none of this would have happened. And now she says she wants it back because at least it seems as though her, her thought process is, you know, this is, this is my missing piece. This is the thing that could have made everything right. And if I had it again, then perhaps that would, that would make me feel much better about myself. However, however, this is someone who appears to be suffering from serious PTSD. And for that reason, it's, may not be the best idea for her to have access to a dangerous firearm such as that at this stage. She perhaps needs a little more time going through therapy before she is ready for that. Otherwise, she may be a risk to herself. She may be a risk to others. And so for that reason, we are deliberately not going to authorize that request. We do get war assets updated from the other one that we went for. And so it'll be kind of interesting to see if we can figure out if that helped us or hurt us. Yeah, I know Bailey's still over there, but, but now, now we will head out as I think we have done everything here in the Citadel that we are looking to do at this stage. So is there a fast travel spot here straight to the Normandy? In either way, we can make it work. We can make it happen. Garrus still waiting ever so patiently Shepard, for us. If you're feeling up to it, I thought we could do something fun for a change. That we will, Garrus. Eventually. Eventually. You discovered a way but I'm deliberately saving that, though. No, okay, so let's head back to the Normandy, because we have a big quest we're looking to do here. And that is, I mean, I'm assuming nothing new from Trainer. No? Okay. So, emails? Nope. Okay. So, as we were saying previously, at this stage, I think what we are looking to do is continue the Leviathan quest, which again was originally in Mass Effect 3, the original version, a DLC. However, a Legendary Edition got rolled into the base game, as did basically every other DLC besides Pinnacle Station. And although this technically was a DLC, and for that reason you might think to yourself, okay, you know, it's it's sort of a side quest, it's probably not necessary, it's maybe not as important, and for that reason, uh, you know, if you're, you're just kind of going through your Mass Effect experience and saying to yourself, I might not necessarily do every mission out there, I'll just do the ones that seem big, that seem important, and maybe this one isn't on the list for that reason, I would strongly advise that you do check it out, because not only does it have some generally cool gameplay, unlike what you might generally think of as what a DLC ought to be in terms of how it fits in with the rest of the, the main plotline of a game, Leviathan in particular does have a very significant tie to the overarching story of the Mass Effect trilogy, and for that reason, it's a little bit alarming that it was included as a DLC and not included as the base game. So, for the sake of getting the full Mass Effect experience, I strongly encourage that if you had doubts about doing Leviathan, definitely, definitely try it out, because I won't go into further detail to avoid spoilers, but let me just say that it is definitely of greater plot significance than you might have initially expected of what was originally a DLC. But without further ado, we're looking for Alex Garneau, who is apparently the best source of information about this 
mysterious Leviathan. Search possible locations across the galaxy to find him. We did, through applying various filters at Dr. Bryson's lab, successfully narrow down Garneau's location to one specific place. So originally, had we not done that, we would have been searching high and low to find him. However, that is not the case here. We should have a very precise location. So this is the main quest, investigate sanctuary. But what we're looking for is the Calston Rift scan for Dr. Garneau. So let's go over here. And this will be our first time in this cluster. Okay, so normally, let's see, would we, hmm. oh, are, is it, is it actually that there are, hold on just a second, is it actually that there are separate clusters that we would have otherwise looked at to try to find him? Like the Kepler Verge? Hold on just a second. So we know he's here. Originally, I thought there were going to be, uh, I thought there were going to be numerous systems in here. It's just going to be a matter of, okay, do we go to Acer first, or do we go to this one over here, or this one down below? And it looks like there's only one additional system. It makes me think that, yeah, it might have been entire clusters that we would have been searching for. Yeah, it must have been, because I remember the map that we were looking at when we were applying the filters was... You know, applying things over here, and over here, and over here, and so on and so forth. Hourglass Nebula. We didn't finish exploration here. We must have missed something before the Reapers invaded. I vaguely recall that it was an area in which we scanned and we got an item in the middle of nowhere, so we expected for the remaining item to be on a planet, but it wasn't. Or if it was, it was on a very remote planet and it was odd that we didn't see it before the Reapers chased us down. So it might actually be worth checking that out real quick before we go and do our leviathan -y stuff. Because, of course, if we find ourselves in the same situation in which we mess up and uh, cannot find the item before the Reapers do chase us down, then completing a mission soon thereafter to reset everything would be nice. Oh, also Aethon Cluster. You know... You know, it might be worth doing that. It might be worth doing that in both these cases. I think we've done a mission since the Reapers chased us out of these clusters because we did do that Cerberus mission. I think was after all this exploration, but uh, you know, if the Reapers are going to chase us out, then we're going to figure that out pretty quickly, I think. So it's a sorry. We are full on fuel and we do get our fuel restocked whenever we finish a mission. So that would suggest that we probably did probably did all this exploration before all that stuff. The problem is, I have precisely zero recollection. I mean, precisely zero rec recollection of what we scanned last time. I assume that we tried doing this and scanning all three of these guys and just did not succeed. And we might have been asking ourselves, uh, was our, our scanning radius big enough to hit all of them? Perhaps, perhaps not. But, hmm. Oh, okay, well, there we go. Yes, Reaper Alertness does fill up pretty quickly, but it is here on Solu Piolis. So, first try, kinda sorta, except we did this earlier, so we'll just ignore that. We have certainly read about this place previously, but as for what the actual asset on the planet is... Bolus Dreadnought, Kwunu. Okay, I mean, that sounds like... That would be a very potent war asset, so good thing we picked it up. Curious to see how much that'll be worth. So that's now, should be, the entire Aethon cluster 100% explored, I believe. That it is. Okay, and that does confirm that now we should not have any Reapers chasing us down, regardless of where we choose to go. So, eyeing... Other places that are not currently at 100%, because as we were saying, this would be a good time to try to knock those out. Kepler, Verge, this... This surprises me. This might be new to us? Dude, 0% on that right now. In the cluster we have been, despite it saying 0%, there's just no assets there. 
I think we might go Hourglass Nebula first. There might even be two things in the Hourglass Nebula that we missed. Anything else over here? Not at 100%. Yeah, let's, let's do a quick check here. This might be another tricky one where we scan to the most obvious of places. Okay, so we have 50% assets at Sowilo. And is that the only thing we're missing or is there something else? Because I thought we might have been missing two things here. Any place down here? No? Okay, it does appear to be just that in that case. Let's see what we can do. So, oh, it's, and it's also, of course, the one that's way out here. So once again, I don't remember specifically what we did and did not explore in this area. Wow, this is far. That costs a lot of fuel. I have to imagine, though. I have to imagine that we tried to scan this. Just knowing me, we probably tried to scan that. And then... Onsus... Isa... Yeah, the problem here... And... Thurisaz. The problem here is that all these outer planets are very spread out, so it's going to be pretty hard to scan all of them before the Reapers chase us down, but let's try. Ooh. Ooh, that's not good. Don't like that. Don't like that. Let's see. Reaper spawn locations. One there. Bunch over on that side. None over here. We should have one more safe scan. I assume... Hold on. I assume that we found something on a planet. Or rather, I assume that we did not find something on a planet, that we must have found something out in the middle of nowhere. And that what is remaining is on a planet. And that we tried to use our scan right here to capture all these planets in this area, but we came up empty, and we just didn't have any more searches, any more scans remaining before the Reapers chased us out. I'll do a quick check. Just to verify that. Because, uh... This is, of course, the only asset we have remaining in this system. If it is in the middle of nowhere, that would usually mean that it is a fuel source. Which normally is not that significant. It's just that we did spend a whole lot of fuel to get here, so... I mean, it, it's a refund in that case, although... <laughs> you make the case that we just ought not to have come here in the first place. Oh, I heard it. It's right there. It was in the middle of nowhere. It was fuel. It was 200 units, uh, which I'm almost certain is significantly less than we paid to get here. Less than we spent to get here. So, uh, well, well, it is fully explored now. Just, uh, did it actually benefit us? Not much other than to say, okay, been there, done that. Because, yeah, we had what? Somewhere in the 600s, maybe? before we went through to explore that location. Now we're in the 300s. So I don't know what the deal is with the Kepler Verge here. I recognize the name because it is definitely a cluster that we had in Mass Effect 1, but I had thought we had explored almost everything that we had remaining. We just deliberately left Calliston Rift unexplored because we knew we were planning to go there, but maybe this one snuck past us. So let's take a quick look. Maybe this is another place where we would have, perhaps, expected to find Garno had we not find our search. Okay, and it is the only cluster in this system. Hmm. This looks vaguely familiar, though, because I... ...do recall seeing a little planet out here with the very defined rings. Just trying to see if the, any of the names ring a bell. Junkro. Hold on a second here. Glencory, is that a place where- Oh, well, that's where we just were. On Taro. This is where we just had our mission. Okay. That explains a lot. And I, yes, and I do- Now it's coming back to me. I remember we scanned aggressively here before we did the mission because we figured there'd be something here, but no, it was completely empty. And we can do a quick scan just to double check, but I doubt we're going to find anything. Reapers won't even try to get us. So, that's just us actually walking up to Sesmos, not a random item. So yeah, okay, turns out this place is empty. Turns out we have, in fact, been there. All right, so that's, that, that at least is a little bit of a, a relief. 
knowing that we did not accidentally miss an entire cluster, but with that being said, now it seems it is time for us to head over to the Callison Rift to see if we can track down this Dr. Garneau individual. Okay, so we're expecting Garneau to be further in that direction. But before we go there, we can explore this system right here. Looks like these are the only two systems. Okay, so let's start with the planets in the outermost area, work our way in, and then take it from there. So first we have Partholon, a large planet composed of ice surrounding a rocky core. Partholon retains trace gases of nitrogen and carbon monoxide. Its crushing gravity makes for an inhospitable stay and mining largely infeasible. However, its orbital proximity to the mass relay in the system means space travelers will, for the next few years, use it for a gravitational slingshot to add speed on their way to and from Calliston. Okay, sounds like not much of interest there. That is a huge planet next to the star. It is bigger than the star, at least from our perspective right now. Elatha. I'm trying to think if we recognize any of these names from Mass Effect 1. A tiny rock planet, Elatha is noted for its frigid temperatures and crushing nitrogen and krypton atmosphere. Lying out beyond the Fomar belt, there is little to recommend it. Okay, also sounds uninspiring. Ooh, I see what looks like it may be a, an asteroid or a dwarf planet in this, this asteroid belt. Either that or it's just a actually the star background that happens to line up in such a way. No, I'm pretty sure it's this right here. Yeah, Grez. I saw you. You couldn't hide from me. A member of the Fomar belt, Grez is a dwarf planet with no atmosphere. It is, however, rich in lithium, which is integral to the heat sinks of many starships and handheld weapons. A large robo-mining operation from Calliston once existed here, but the miners quickly abandoned the area when they learned they were in the path of the Reapers. Oh, that's nasty. Okay. So that probably rises to the top of the list of things that I would like to scan here. Can't help but notice that Calliston does not appear to have a ring around it to suggest where its orbit is. What is the deal, Calliston? We also heard reference to it when we were reading about the dwarf planet. Calston is the largest satellite of the gas giant Cernunos. Oh, so it's actually a moon? It looks huge for a moon. Ancient asteroid strikes deposited major loads of element zero within the molten sulfur mantle. Eldefeld Ashland Energy's mining operations made it the largest source of starship drive core material in the Attican Traverse, which threatened Calston's native biodiversity with industrial waste. Calston is racked with volcanism due to the tidal stresses from Cernunos. Because of weak solar output, plant-like life on Calston is not carbon-based and photosynthetic, but silicon-based and thermosynthetic, requiring heat rather than sunlight to power chemical reactions. These organisms flourish in volcanic vents and during solar flares when Baylor, Calston's sun, can double or triple in luminosity. Oh, wow. Oxygen-breathing habitation is not possible outside of its many domed cities. Those cities are now feasts for the Reapers, who drove off Calston's protective fleet and now threaten to puncture domes to force the population into submission. Oh, wow. I mean, that's well strategized by the Reapers, but this is no small colony. 1.8 billion people here. Nowhere near the number I was expecting. I was expecting one, maybe even two orders of magnitude less than that. Maybe even three orders of magnitude less than that. So, okay, well, obviously, estimations are pre-service invasion, or, I mean, maybe service as well, but mostly Reapers. Okay, huh. And for a, a place that is not all that hospitable, very interesting. Okay, so that's also a potential scanning target. Here is Cernunos. I suppose this is so huge that it makes some sense that there would be a humongous uh, satellite orbiting it. But it still, at least from our perspective, does appear to be bigger than the star, which is crazy. The entire solar system is actually orbiting around you. Now, Cernunos is a sizable gas giant with high nitrogen content. It is believed to be an extrasolar capture due to its close stellar location. In a rare phenomenon, it is near enough to its red dwarf star to be within the life zone, although its massive size prevents the tidal lock that usually occurs at this range. While nothing could survive on the surface of a planet with such crushing gravity, Cernunos' moon, Calliston, has life. 
Sununos was skimmed for its abundant hydrogen, and refineries on Kallistan pr processed it into a metastable metallic form for use as starship fuel. The Reapers have since destroyed this operation. Why do you have to destroy everything cool, Reapers? Okay, so, in terms of what we'd like to scan here, if we could get Sir Nunos, Kallistan, and Brace at the same time, that'd be amazing, but I don't think our scanner is big enough to do that, so I think we might settle for Kallistan. I it is big something. enough, and actually it was Brace. Oh, and good thing we nailed it, because uh, Reapers are very close to invading the system. Okay, so let's see what we can find here. Oh, this looks like it's at the bottom, but that actually means that it is perfectly on the opposite side of this dwarf planet. There you are. Synth diamond heat sinks. Okay, I mean, it's a war asset. I can't exactly say that I know what that means. I mean, we heard a description about heat sinks when we were there at the, the planetoid. Okay, so here's the thing. We have one more asset here. We assume that it is in the middle of nowhere and that it is probably fuel. However, with one more scan, we are certainly going to attract Reaper's attention. And we'd rather not... Well, I mean, I would say we'd rather not have this system in which the mass relay is located be overrun by Reapers. Then again, assuming that we are about to go on and, and do this mission to find Dr. Garneau, then once we finish that mission, the Reaper presence will be reset. We should be fine. Not to mention if we head back, in theory, I would assume we'd spawn in right here, right next to the mass relay, since we'll be coming from this direction. So for all those reasons, might actually be okay for us to do this now. And then again, if it is fuel, then we're going to get a free re restock on fuel once we finish a mission anyway. So it doesn't really provide any incremental value to us, except we might not have enough fuel to get to this next system. Hold on. How far is it? Because we don't have a lot of fuel right now. It's pretty far. We've 336 fuel, which I don't think will be sufficient. Oh, and that is not the direction that I expected us to get spawned in from, but okay. So we were checking bottom right. I assume it's fuel located in the middle of nowhere. That was nothing. That was just the planet. But it could end up being one of these planets. We definitely did get the three planets in the middle. Planet, dwarf planet, and satellite, technically, but you know what I mean. Is that something? So that means if it is a planet, it would definitely be one of the two outermost ones. Hmm. Oh! There it is. Gotcha. 350. The Reapers might be spawning right on top of us. Kinda, sorta. So we gotta go. See, the thing is that we gotta go. Faster than light jump successful. And we are really hoping that 686 fuel is enough to get out of here. And by get out of here, I mean actually make it all the way to this other system. Otherwise, we are in a fair bit of trouble. But I think by the looks of things, we'll be good here. Yeah, definitely. We just now need to absolutely make sure that we finish this mission. Uh now because if we do have to double back then uh, then we're we're in a whole lot of trouble this is a big big solar system as well for what it's worth so if we do want to scan here that's gonna be kind of difficult oh except we're expecting to have a mission here which should mean that no matter what reapers will not spawn here so that might save our butts a little bit first we have Tamgauta. The outermost planet of the Acer system, Temgauta is remote and largely unex unexplored. Its carbon dioxide atmosphere has long since frozen it into fields of dry ice. Okay, sounds remarkably uninteresting, or at least unlikely to have things of note there. Sheer, a remote rock planet capped in ice, Sheer has been exploited by Arvunen corporations for its minerals. I have no idea what that means. Arvunen? I don't think I've ever seen that before. Home to gold veins, used in spaceship shielding as well as jewelry, and cobalt deposits, used in high tensile alloys, Shear's resources show no signs of being exhausted anytime soon. A light gravity helps keep the, the planetary exploration or exportation process cheap. Convenient. 
Okay, next we have Alformus. A hydrogen helium gas giant, Alformus had its helium-3 refueling stations destroyed in an attack by Grow Zero, an anti-population terrorist group that wanted to stop further immigration to Arvuna. Huh. Okay, that maybe is one of the other planets in this system, and a planet that has life on it. That might explain previous entry that we were reading. A consortium of Arvuna-based corporations are currently rebuilding the stations. Alliance Advisory. Alformus is not considered vital to the stability of the Acer system. Civilians working on the Helium-3 platforms should not expect Alliance military intervention in case of kidnapping or other violence. Oh, yikes. Sorry, guys. You're not important enough to us. Let's do a little... Oh, search around the asteroid belt, because yes, there is something here. Mahavid. We have located Garno. Oh. Okay. That was kind of devious, located in the asteroid belt. Mahavid is a metallic asteroid in the very sparse Nahata belt. It has a high nickel and iron content in the life form of... Or in the form of Camasite. No, no life forms, at least not listed here. The rights to mine Mahavid belong to the TGES Mineral Works, who sell their products primarily to the colonists of Arvuna. Okay. The close flyby reveals light emanating from its facilities. Population just 152, so very small. Of course, all pre-invasion. Basically no atmosphere, because it's just an asteroid. It's not a planet. Hmm. Interesting. So that is, of course, where we will end up going eventually. But let's read up on the other planets. We'll scan to see if we find anything else in the area. And then once we've done that, we'll, of course, go on to the mission. Okay. Also, it is very well hidden. You can kind of see that it's more circular and a, perhaps slightly more prominent than the other debris in this asteroid belt. But, I mean, it's still smaller than, say, this random junk here that isn't actually anything of any significance. Likewise here. So, yeah, that's that's potentially an easy one to miss. This is also tiny over here. Shasu. Shasu is a dwarf planet that is believed to have been ejected from Agnin during a giant impact with another planet-sized body. At the time, a magma ocean covered much of Agnin's surface, the liquid rock sprayed into space, where it coalesced and cooled over millions of years. It is theorized that during this cooling, Shasu orbited Agnin, but was eventually pulled from that orbit by the gravity wells of other planets. Primarily, drain it. And I'm sure we'll read about those planets in a second. Today, Shasu is relatively temperate with light hydrogen helium atmosphere that attracts spacers who use it, its atmosphere to refuel. Its crust composition is similar to Agnin, evident in its high sulfur content. Hmm, I mean, 23 degrees Celsius on the surface. Uh, the atmospheric pressure is low and gravity is almost non existent, but I suppose there, there are worse places. Oh, actually, that's further in than here's Drainin, and here's Arvuna, which is the place that we heard people saying has been, uh, does have settlement, does have people living there. And once again, looks like it's a satellite, much like some of the stuff that we were looking at previously. Start with Drainin, though. A sizable hydrogen helium gas giant just on the far side of its pale yellow star's frost line, Drainin is known for its spectacular storms. At least three persistent observable spots. Actually, cyclonic and anticyclonic storms have lasted for over 544 years, significantly longer than Jupiter's red spot. The largest of these spots, the Ishna, has consistently held a diameter over three times that of Earth. Oh! Jupiter's red spot is huge as well, but I don't remember how big it is relative to Earth. Raynan has 44 moons. Two of them are of special interest to the Citadel Committee on Habitable Worlds. The first, Arvuna, is a life-bearing world that has already been colonized. The second, Alaya, is slowly being terraformed into an ammonia-based world for Volus populations. That'd be cool to have... It'd actually be really interesting. You have a one, one satellite orbiting this planet that is for oxygen-slash-carbon-based organisms, and then another one that is also orbiting the same planet that is for ammonia-based. So you have humans and volus neighbors more so or much closer than you'd ever see anywhere else so here's arvuna which is that carbon based life supporting satellite arvuna a moon of drainin is classified as a water world because oceans or ice cover 90 percent of its surface we heard that the 
the planet that this is orbiting is technically in the past the frost line, so you would assume that much of the time this is ice. But I wonder if depending on how far it is in its orbit around its planet, you know, maybe if it's closer to the star during that time of the year, its oceans are actually water, whereas if it goes to the opposite side, the far side, then they freeze over into ice. Besides prodigious sea life, Arvuna is home to a host of venomous arthropodal pests. Uh, no thanks, I will not be visiting anytime soon. In the tropical zone, with metallic carapaces, similar to those found on Palavin, to resist radiation coming from Draenon's magnetosphere. Yeah, no thanks. Definitely not my style. There are several well-shielded human colonies on Arvuna, although they are alienated from the Council and politically insignificant to the Traverse and Terminus systems. Reapers have yet to reach Arvuna, concentrating instead on the Baylor system. While this cuts Arvuna off from the Cluster's Mass Relay, it is at least some evidence that the Reapers cannot be everywhere at once. Population, I think, was significantly less than that of the planet we were looking at in the, or the satellite we were looking at in the Baylor system, which was a little over a billion, and this one is not even a million. So yeah, several orders of magnitude less. One degree Celsius, presumably that varies a lot, but pressure, that's I mean, a little bit dense. Gravity, a little bit much, but overall, bearable, you would think. Okay, lastly, we have Agnon. A hothouse planet, Agnon's scorching clouds of methane and sulfur dioxide give the planet a pale green color in visible light. The SO2 from volcanic activity rains down as sulfuric acid in the upper atmosphere, but this is boiled away before the liquid reaches the surface. Agnon's harsh environment has prevented exploration by anything except probes. Yeah, pretty thick atmosphere, 86 atmospheres, or really 87, and almost 700 degrees Celsius. No thanks. Okay, so presumably we can scan as much as we would like here and not have to worry about Reapers invading the system because we have a mission here. I'm just going to deliberately walk up to... Walk up fly over to all the planets and see if there is anything here, and then other than that, we can basically just spam the scan button, see if there's anything in the middle of nowhere, not need to worry at all about actually manually sifting through everything and waiting till we hear a little boop sound. Shouldn't be necessary. Signal confirmed. Oh! Here I was about to say, ah, clearly there must not be anything over here. Not so. Not so. Presumably this is fuel which actually doesn't matter all that much because, again, after finishing a mission, we are likely to get all of our fuel reset. Okay, we do get a spot here on Mavid, so I suppose if you go anywhere, come anywhere near this and you do a scan, you can catch it that way, whereas we just happened to search the whole asteroid belt and came across it organically that way. But okay, I mean, we'll take this, even if it's not super helpful for us. It is fuel, it's 150, which is not a lot. Might not even be enough to get... Ah, it's probably still enough to get back to the the home... Uh, or the, the mass relay system. Then again, like I said, I believe our fuel should get reset after we finish this mission. But, but, that is what we're looking to do here. So let's hop back out for a second. Because, as a reminder, we're looking to find Garneau... Alex Garneau is the best source of information about the Leviathan. Search possible locations across the galaxy to find him. And we have, at least theoretically, found him here. So, of course, we started off the Leviathan DLC first in Dr. Bryson's lab. Bryson got murdered right in front of us. Then we had to scavenge his lab to collect more information about this Leviathan and learn that it might give us some useful information about the Reapers, perhaps, I think was the reason why we... Admiral Hackett has said, Shepard, you might want to look into this. And then we found out that apparently this Garneau was the person who had been coordinating with Dr. Bryson. Therefore, with Dr. Bryson now dead, that made Garneau the next person on our list that we would like to talk to to learn whatever there is to learn about this Leviathan. 